If there's any event you see that go to low battery, I'll, I'll walk my laptop over. Um, and if you can just plug this into the laptop and then have the power keeps going, it'll yeah. be yeah. perfect. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Last time Ken Wilber went at night halfway through. How is yeah. it? How powered up is it? Um, it should be at about 80, so, but the video makes it go quick. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. 
Yes and no? Yes and no. I love the beach. Yeah. But I mean, I spoke about this. So it's like, yeah. I was so manicured. I grew up in that way. Yeah. Um, and I got to spend some of my life in Commerce City. Okay. And some of church. And some of the other communities in Commerce City. Uh, okay. Yeah, because it is so manicured. Because yeah. San Diego is not. Not many. Yeah. Okay, I was trying. The right. North Park Public Church is this kind of transitional area. Oh, okay. So it's very. Yeah. Um, it's just in the process. It's like yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, they are wrapping up as we are starting. Um, but this is part of the community work we do to make sure that there is music happening in the lives of our children in this neighborhood. So um, thank you for putting up with that tonight. But uh, they're a good group. And if you are looking for music lessons, I know who to, uh, to tell you to talk to. Um, I am very excited to introduce to you Brandon Robertson tonight. He is um, our new executive director of Nomad Partnerships. And that is who is bringing you the event tonight. On their website, they say, Nomad Partnerships exists to foster social and spiritual evolution through training, education, convening, and mobilizing leaders from social, political, and religious sectors to be agents of justice and reconciliation throughout the United States and around the world. Um, and certainly, the event tonight, uh, I think, fits your uh, mission statement there. Uh, Brandon is the newly uh, called pastor to Mission Fellowship, Gathering. Mission Gathering um, in San Diego, and so just took that this last week, yes, yes. and um, he is here. Uh, he does a lot of work on behalf of millennials, on spirituality, um, on uh, LGBTQ issues, and uh, we're very excited to have him here tonight, and I'm going to leave it up to him to introduce Father Richard Moore to you. So, Brandon. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's so good to be here. I might just use that thing. Oh, no. Just because my hair is there. That might be. Well, tonight. The other one does work. I've figured out the problem. Cool. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, and thanks for being here tonight. Um, this is the second event in a series of events that we're hosting at Nomad Partnerships, um, quite literally across the country and around the world. Um, the first event we hosted was in April in Denver with Ken Wilber. Um, we'll be hosting a number of other ones with Krista Tippett, um, Thomas Moore, and Father Lawrence Freeman in London in November. And the purpose of these events is over the short spiritual journey I've had over the past 10 years, I've gotten the chance to know and connect with some of these really revolutionary and prophetic voices that are really able to see what is happening in the world and what is happening in the spiritual lives of the world. And as you know, we are in a moment of history that is unlike any other in recent history at least. It's a moment of reformation and of transformation. And we have an opportunity in this moment to either grow really pessimistic and afraid, or we can understand that what's happening in this moment is that every time the spirit stirs up transformation, there is a giant push forward and a push backwards. And that there actually is a trajectory to everything that's happening. That the spirit of God is actually at work in the world and that there is a future. And as somebody who's been involved in spiritual writing and in various types of ministry and now pastoral ministry, I've felt the angst that so many religious leaders have felt, wondering, is there a future to religion? Because all of the polls uniformly in the United States and in the Western world show that institutionalized religion is declining. Younger people and people of all generations, if we're honest, are leaving the institutionalized church in search for something deeper, something more fulfilling. And that raises the question, is there a future to religion and is there a future to spirituality? And if so, what does that look like? And I think when we start touching on the topic of what is the future of religion and spirituality, we actually get into the topic of what is the future of society and humanity? What is the purpose of all of this and where is the spirit leading us in this moment? And so tonight I'm really honored to be here with uh, somebody that I consider a friend and a mentor and somebody I've looked at, looked up to for years. Um, I first met Father Richard Rohrer while I was a student at Moody Bible Institute, which if you know anything about Moody Bible Institute, it's a fundamentalist Baptist college in Chicago. And I was an unlikely person to be uh, going to a Richard Rohrer conference. Um, but we sat down and we did an interview with friends of mine. Um, we both sat down with Father Rohr and we did this interview and 
during that process really was one of the first times where we heard this articulation of a gospel that was truly good news for everybody. And we kept actually, it's funny, you can go on YouTube and find the interview, um, and we kept calling Father Rohr a universalist, <laughs> which is probably true, it's an accurate word maybe, uh, he can address that, but it was in our evangelical lens that we only knew how to label people so that we could distance ourselves. And yet through the process of getting to sit and listen and hear this different perspective, a deeper perspective, on who Jesus is and what this whole thing is about, my faith began to get shaped. And um, actually I wrote a book called Nomad, A Spirituality for Traveling Light, and the whole last chapter is dedicated to that interview that I had with Father Rohr and the experience afterwards of moving from a faith of rigid certainty and dogma to a faith of wonder and awe. And I think that's my answer to what the direction of spirituality is. But tonight, I'm really excited to be in conversation again with Father Richard Rohr. Um, as you all likely know, Father Rohr has written too many books to name um, and has a massive influence on people around the world in various traditions. His readership is actually higher among evangelicals than it is among any other group. And so he has this wide reach and is really influencing and changing and helping to shape what the future of Christianity and spirituality looks like. And so, with that, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome to the stage Father Richard Rohr. Good to be with you all. Oh, let me turn this a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that's so nice to just come down the street. And for so many years, I flew around the world, but to do more in Albuquerque is the delight of my old age. So thank you for inviting me. So we're going to do this in a dialogue form, sir. Yes. Yeah, so the way I, I hope I don't get off your question. No. But, yeah. We all enjoy that. Um, the way I want to begin is, um, the first part of this, I just want to ask you the blunt question. Uh, what is the future of spirituality oh in your own? <laughs> as if I should know. Um, well, let's say that as a disclaimer. Uh, I, I, it's a presumptuous question for me to try to answer it. But let's talk around it and see if it does ring true to you. And if it does, well, we have time for questions afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's certainly going to be different. I mean, you mentioned uh, that people are leaving, and I'd add to that, they're leaving in big numbers. It's not small. Uh, statistically, you know, these churches are all going to be empty in 30 years. If you just follow the statistics and the millennial attempt to uh, be a part of that. But it was probably good that you said future of spirituality, not the future of religion. And I still believe, maybe if I'm going to show my basic conservatism here, I still believe you need a container to carry through the contents, and to pass it on to a, a further generation. Now what the shape of that container is going to be, that's what's really the question. Uh, but uh, it, it, you know, even though the wonderful secular seekers that I work with so much anymore, almost all of them will tell you that they first got imprinted, if I can use that word, by their early years in a church, you know? Maybe they left it, maybe they moved beyond it, maybe they even rejected it, but um, there was an initial infusion of something that fascinated them. Now very often they found a way to live it without all the window dressing, if I can put it that way. I don't mean that as a put down. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that we did substitute the container for the contents. I'm going to pick on my own Catholic church, first of all. Certainly, I think any honest Catholic would have to admit that we pretty much worship the church. <laughs> and, and a lot of Catholics don't, aren't even comfortable talking about Jesus. But what an embarrassment, you know? Uh, but it's, it's probably the extreme example of the, the belonging system outweighing the one you belong to, the relational world. And uh, certainly that's where we're moving. In my last book on the Trinity, I, I, I try to rebuild from the bottom up, and for me, 
that if we're going to rebuild Christianity from the bottom up, we've got to recognize the relational character of God, which we Christians call Trinity. But I think it's overwhelmingly true, and it'd be hard to disagree with this, that I don't know what denomination you're from, I hope you're from many, but very few of us were sincerely Trinitarian. For all practical purposes, God was an old man, a deity on a cloud somewhere, which is a pagan notion of God. And I want to say that as strongly as I can. Uh, so if we're going to reform the whole thing, we've got to get back to what is the shape of God? Uh, who is this that we're dealing with? Now, the wonderful thing about a Trinitarian notion is it, it moves you into a relational universe. Not the worship of a distant deity, or the placating of a distant deity, but the recognizing that, as Genesis 1, 26, 27 says, everything is created in the image of this God. So if the image of God is, in the beginning, is the relationship, let us create in our image, then this has got to be our takeoff point. And I, we, could, we could spend a whole weekend on that. Once religion is about authentic relationship, or right relationship, instead of being right, that's a whole different ball. Game. Whole different ball. Game. And I say that f with very conservative credentials. No one can fight me on that. <laughs> and the amazing thing is so many people who call themselves traditional Presbyterians or anything usually aren't very traditional at all. You understand? They, in, and by that I mean they're not Trinitarian. They're not relational. Um, so, many theologians are predicting that the future of Christianity has got to rebuild on a Trinitarian foundation. That, the way I said it, I talked to a group this afternoon, some of whom are humbly here to hear more of it, I can't believe it. But um, <laughs> what we're saying in a Trinitarian notion of God is God is much more a verb than a noun. I just hold that. God is much more a verb than a noun. And that's about as traditional second, third century Christian teaching as I can offer. You know, let me jump in with that. Because you, I know in, in your tradition, universalist is a real put down. It totally surprises me. Why would you want to say Jesus is, a, is the savior of the world, but we don't really mean it. We're not for the whole universe. We're just for a little tribe, a little group, you know? We defeat our own message. Our God is so great that we make him tribal again. But you do know, and I'm not trying to make Roman Catholics out of anybody, but the word Catholic means universal. Right? So yes, I'm a universalist. I'm a Catholic. And some of you who recite the creed, you still say the one holy Catholic with a small c. And I admit it. Roman Catholic is an oxymoron. All right, it's, it's a contradiction in terms. You're either Roman or you're Catholic. And we became much more Roman than Catholic. But a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters were never even Catholic. You understand? Which is the undivided church of the first thousand years. And that's what we got to get back to. Because it's, it's ironically, it's much more broad minded. The, read the Eastern Fathers. It's a much bigger picture than the later fights of the Reformation, which are much smaller field. As I told the group this afternoon, you know, the Western and the Eastern Church is divided in 1054. So we stopped studying the Eastern Fathers in most Western seminaries. That's where all the contemplative teaching was. That's where all the Trinitarian teaching was. Then when the good Reformation comes, and I do mean that, I'm not anti-Reformation by any means, but what Protestants need to realize is they were at best reforming half of the pie. You follow me? And, and what we're and this is you know what we're dealing with now is finally having access to the whole pie: the Hebrew Scriptures, the intertestamental literature, the New Testament, the whole two thousand year tradition. Now, when we Catholics use the word tradition, what we usually mean is the way they did it in Rome in the 14th century or something like that. Um, and the way Protestants use it is the way they did it in Alabama in 1900. At least the more recent fundamentalists. Neither of those are worthy of being called tradition. And you are the first, thanks to things like Google, 
the first generation, we can't fool you anymore. If you want to know the whole picture, you can get it. You can read the fathers of the church you know, and realize how uh, they proudly took to themselves, starting in the year 108, Ignatius of Antioch is marching from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. And as he goes through Asia Minor, stopping in all these little villages, uh, he recognizes that all these people, it's 108, Jesus hasn't been dead that long, that they're all joining this new universal religion. And he calls us a Catholic people. You know? So that's where the name came from. It was not a sectarian name, like you and I think of it as now. It was precisely a universalist name. So I proudly hold the name of the Universalist uh, because I believe that Jesus, rightly understood as the Christ, is a message for all the creation. It's not a tribal religion at all. So maybe that's a start. Yeah, okay, that's good. So what I hear you saying is kind of three areas. One, we need to reframe how we think about and who we think of God as, the shape of God. Shape of um, the reintegration of East and West, of head and heart, of logic and the mystical. That's very good. The Eastern was much more heart based than yeah. the West. The West went through Greek language and Greek thinking, and there was good aspects that yeah. put us up here. Yeah. yeah. And even though, and this is something that I think a lot of people find, a good number of people find um, interesting when they first hear, is that there's also, um, in a lot of people that are talking about the future of religion and spirituality, a strong sense of needing to actually reclaim tradition, which is something that millennials, yeah. uh, not to say we are leading this in any way, I think this is actually happening across generations, but one thing that got me on this path was being in Bible college at a fundamentalist Baptist school and seeing kids wake up at five in the morning to sneak over to the Eastern Orthodox Church and participate in the morning yeah. prayers. <laughs> and now one of the biggest um, churches among conservative evangelicals is the conservative breakoff of the Anglican Church. This rediscovery of this rich tradition and ritual, but reapplying meaning to it that um, is far beyond the mythic meaning. So does that sound like Yeah, you? see that's, to me that's predictable. That's yeah. what's going to happen. Now, they'll go back to that just to, and you know this story, they'll be disappointed there too. I'm sure. Because they're going to find Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism are also trapped. Right. Now, but that, they're still moving out of their little tribe. Yeah. And if we're going to talk about Jesus being the Savior of the world, as John 4 says, then we better start making Jesus big enough for the whole world. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So now we're going to zoom out. We started on spirituality. We're going to come back clearly to spirituality, but let's zoom out just a little bit because we're in a moment of incredible tension and chaos in the world in very many ways. Everything from Donald Trump to Brexit to the terrorist attacks that are happening every week, it seems like. And so for a lot of people who believe and are inclined to believe in the evolution of humanity and evolutionary spirituality, this is a moment where we're being called to doubt whether that is true. Is humanity really progressing? Or is this a moment and an indicator that maybe we are digressing and going in a different direction? So I'm gonna throw that to you. Okay. You know, I, I, I began to address this in my book, Falling Up. That it seems, I don't know what your church is saying, but a common phraseology from early Christianity is we are saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, you ask the typical Catholic what that means, they don't have a clue. But they wouldn't think of denying it, you know? Yes, we are saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Death implies pushback, you see. And there's a saying, the way history proceeds is not a straight line, right? In fact, the death usually has to precede the resurrection. Uh, we haven't played out the implications of this. This is universal truth. One of uh, the teachers in our living school here in Albuquerque is a wonderful Anglican woman priest, uh, Cynthia Bourgeau. Cynthia's got a mind that's, oh, I wish I had one-tenth the mind she has. She can put together theological concepts in profound ways. And her book, On the Trinity and the Law of Three, I'd like to share with you. 
she's relying upon, uh, in this in particular, uh, the Russian mystic Gurdjieff, who says that all of history moves by wholly affirming there's a new arising of a new idea, a new progress in history. Whenever you have wholly affirming, it will with absolute certainty be met by wholly denying. There will always be a move back against it. So, so what we're seeing, you could say, this doesn't offend anybody, but it's the last gasp of white, upper class people who want to control the world, you know? And they're going to try as long as they can, as much as they can. It, it's totally predictable that it's going to happen, you know? But in this tension, the whole thing moves to what Gurdjieff called holy reconciling. And I am seeing, honestly, even since November, the, uh, the amount of mobilization talks like this, that people say, you know, I think I've got to start being serious about my Christianity. It's not just a belonging system anymore. It really has to represent a transformed consciousness that that many people who call themselves Christians could do what they just did is to anybody who was an outside observer is unthinkable, unthinkable, you know? And, but that's what it takes, that kind of pushback to, and to go almost too far the other direction where we say, what have we become? You know, what are we doing? What do we really stand for? So we're in the holy denying. You know, they say after every great reformation, you had the French Revolution, you have Napoleon, right? We had the, those who were Catholics, we had our wonderful Second Vatican Council in the early 1960s. Then by the 1980s, we had Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict II, basically without a million, wanted to push back. We want to be open to Protestants, but not that much. <laughs> we still want to be the one holy Catholic apostolic church and all the rest of you are heretics, real. You know? <laughs> Whenever you have a new movement or new arise in history, you will, with total predictability, have resistance to it. And we have our Thomas Jefferson saying, all men are created equal. You know we didn't mean that, you know? And we started being obvious about it. Women didn't have the votes. You know, black people certainly didn't have the votes. So we make these grand affirmations, pretend we believe them, and then all the loose ends get pushed back against it. And in that is the refining, or what Gurdjieff would call the holy reconciling. Now, the, the paradigm you're more familiar with <clears throat> is probably the Hegelian thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But let me tell you the difference. And I think it's a significant one. Most of us are raised on the Hegel's thing of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But it showed itself in like the psychology of Carl Jung as being balancing the opposites. <coughs> Any of you who are Jungians who know this language. And here's what's different about, I think, the gospel. The gospel isn't talking about balancing the opposites, but holding the opposites. Can you feel the difference? See, I see the cross. This was very strong in my own Franciscan tradition. St. Bonaventure said the two nailed hands of Jesus on the cross are holding the two opposing paradoxical sides of everything and paying the price in himself, like Ephesians would say, reconciling. So holding the opposites, and we can talk about this if you want. It takes a while for that to sink in. Because like even what's happening now, I don't know if you can balance it. Understand? You have to suffer the absurdity of it. You have to hold the pain of it. You have to, instead of just lashing back or calling other people names that aren't going to help anything. So it, it's third way thinking. But I think it's a significant refinement to the third way thinking that even Martin Luther King and Gandhi would have offered us, which thank God we got that far. But we still thought we could balance. Although if you look at Gandhi and Martin Luther King, they were holding too. They were really balanced. So I think this is where the gospel leads you. To share the faith of God for the life of the world. 
That's the Christian vocation. To share the faith of God to the life of the world. Now, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. As I said many times in the New Testament, that's Christian belief. Then we have to believe that Jesus reveals what the heart of God is like. And it says that the heart of God is suffering. The heart of God is identified with all you and suffering. Uh, not, not solving it, holding it. Feel the difference again? And you and I, because we're pragmatic Americans, we want to solve problems. That's the way we're all trained, especially if you're male. We males love to be problem solved. But uh, it's hard to make the, the cross into the solving of the problem. It's the revealing of the problem and the holding of the problem, which is the solving of the problem. But you can bring me back to that if you want. No, I think that's so profound and beautiful for what we're experiencing right now because it seems like this moment is a moment um, where we can say that the Spirit is calling all of us who claim the name of Christ to account because even us on the more progressive end of the spectrum are being called in this moment to be able to, yes, understand and call out the pain and injustice, but also to hold it and not hate it and not to uh, turn against our enemy and scapegoat because that perpetuates the cycle of violence. Um, so I think that's just perfect insight perfect. that you have. Yeah. Um, so we'll slip back into the institution. I just, I want to ask, do you think we're sitting in a church and you made a comment 10 minutes ago that if you follow the trajectory of how things are declining right now, that churches will be empty in 50 years. Do you think that that result is inevitable? Do you think there's a hope for institutions and faith communities? Um, and if there is, what steps could they take to begin moving in step with this new age of the spirit? You know, institutions don't normally change until they have to. If there's only one thing more egocentric than the individuals, it's the corporation, right? <laughs> and that's what got us in this pedophile crisis, the church is in. The bishops, in the name of protecting Catholicism, didn't protect children. Because we love the institution more, it seems, than the rights of children. So if that's true, that institutions, organizations don't change until they have to, uh, I think whatever change is coming is in great part going to be forced upon us. But there's going to be the, the necessity of some of you, maybe a good portion of people like you who would come out on a Friday night, who, who create the trajectory, who, who carry the continuity, you know, who go into Babylon and come back and rebuild the temple. And I don't know what the second temple is going to look like in this case, but um, I am a believer in what the prophets taught, which was radical traditionalism. In other words, we can't start history in 2017. We've got, and this for me is very Catholic, we, are, we have to have the burden of carrying the whole of history. And we need people who are wise people who know the whole picture and don't think that we started in Alabama in 1970 or something like that. Don't be the pick on Alabama. But, uh, the vision of Christianity that has been exported to much of the world is from the southern part of the United States at the turn of the last century. It, it has no tradition to it. And it's, it, the fathers of the church wouldn't recognize it as anything to do. And I'm not saying the fathers of the church have the whole picture either. But can we uh, connect the dots? So it's going to look very different. Certainly it's going to be less tied to uh, what you rightly called at the beginning, you know, dogmatic faith affirmations. If you believe this, you are a Christian. That's too heady. It really doesn't mean you love anybody. You know, uh, who was it? Origen, I think, said, you can believe every one of the doctrines of the church and not love God for one second. <laughs> you can believe every one of the affirmations of the creed and not love your neighbor in the least. How have we been able to make that split? That just because you affirm the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed that you were a Christian. So I think the big difference we're going to, well, one of the big differences 
is the future is going to be much more practice based. Orthopraxy, we call it, instead of just verbal orthodoxy. And we allowed orthodoxy to be defined largely as verbal. Say the right words and you're a Christian. And this is what's showing itself, that racism has persisted at the highest levels of Christianity, sexism, homophobia, people with, with total materials claiming to follow the poor Jesus. I mean, this, this won't sell anymore. The, word, the world doesn't believe it. You're a materialist. You're not a follower of a simple, humble Jesus who, uh, who didn't go there. At all. Of course, I'm a Franciscan, and we took that to the nth degree, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but what Francis was trying to do in the 13th century was to take this already opulent Roman church back to a little bit of authenticity. So you can imagine, of course, when this Jesuit Pope took our name, Francis, we were just overjoyed. <laughs> we knew he was going to be different. And, you know, you almost have to be from inside the Catholic team to recognize um, that Francis is the utter anti-establishment saint. Right? And for a pope, the utter establishment figure to take the name of an anti-establishment, he was telling us where he's going. And he's still trying to go, but they're fighting him. You know? Getting a lot of pushback. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I, love it. I, just, I reflect on hearing you say that and seeing what's happening. And, you know, Jesus says in the Gospels that um, in the last days, whatever that means, uh, we will no longer worship God in temples made by human hands, but in spirit and in truth. And for me, that seems like the prophetic moment that we're entering in, yeah. the temple is falling to pieces. Not one stone will be left on another, Jesus said. That was literal in the first century. Uh, and then here we are 2,000 years later, and the temple that we've reconstructed in his name is falling to pieces. And we are worshiping God in the integrated way, spirit and truth, head and heart. Um, so I love hearing you articulate that as somebody who's about to be a pastor, that we can actually find new ways um, and reconnect to older traditional ways that we are part of this beautiful wisdom tradition. Let me build on that a little since we're under these beautiful Pentecostal flames here. Um, and this is relying upon a wonderful evangelical scholar who I'm sure you studied it, but I hope you did. N.C. Wright? Yeah, all right. N.C. Wright gives evangelicalism a good name. And I read several of his books on, on Paul before I took a the Pauline pilgrimage a few years ago. And if you'll allow me, it'll just take about four minutes, but you'll find this quite worth your time, and it builds on what you just said about the temple. He points <coughs> out, which had never been pointed out to me, that at the dedication of the first temple, the temple Jesus would have never seen, it was destroyed at the time of the Babylonian captivity. When they dedicated the temple, there, at least in the several accounts in the Hebrew scriptures, it says that a great fire descended from heaven and filled the temple. And so this, of course, gave the Jewish religion great self-confidence. If you got God in your church that visibly, as it were, well, you must be the true religion. So Judaism lived in great self-confidence in the period of the first temple, because we got God. We saw him on the day of dedication, the Shekinah glory of God. Then, of course, that temple is destroyed. They're driven into exile in Babylon. They return, and Ezra and Nehemiah and Jeremiah tell them to rebuild the temple, uh, which they do, and they're just quite convinced on the dedication of the second temple, there's going to be the repeat of the epiphany, the, the manifestation, the fire from heaven. It didn't happen. And if you read the text, you can almost sense the embarrassment. This was always an embarrassment. Why did the glory of God not fill the second temple? Now that helps you understand why Jesus says, and you were already saying, why the temple has to go. But it's because it's our attempt to localize God and to make God into a tribal God for our people. And he even goes so far as to say, the Phariseeism that emerged in that period, that thought Jesus so much, we made Pharisee a bad name, of course, what, why this emerged was they had the idea, if we just follow the law perfectly, jot and tittle, 
if we will be more moral than anybody else, more liturgically correct than anybody else, the fire will return to the temple. That he claims, and he made, creates a real foundation for our understanding of this, he is the basis for all legalistic religion. The fear that you don't have God. And if I just obey more commandments, or have a little more purity code. Now, get ready for Pentecost. Now you understand where I'm going, where he's going, where the, the scriptures are going. He says, only with that background do you understand the significance of now the people, the mobile temple, if you want to call it that, the fire now descending not on a building, but on living human beings. And then he claims, in disagreement with Martin Luther, I hate to disagree with Martin Luther in this 500th anniversary, but he feels that Luther sent us on an overly introspective, individualistic track of private salvation, salvation by faith, sola scriptura. It was all too narrow, and at great length, he says, here is Paul's supreme idea. And once you hear it, you go home and read Paul's letters. It's everywhere. Paul's supreme idea is this. The new temple is the human person. The new temple is the human person. That is just magnificent. And, and, and I have to belabor my way from pages and pages. I mean, he, he doesn't say anything if he can't back it up. You know? but, but then I went to Paul and read I said, why did I never see that? So once we've got that, we've got what you exactly you're saying. If the new temple is the mobile temple, if you are the living temple of the Holy Spirit, which Paul says in every one of his letters, uh, then we don't have to be so preoccupied with, not that I don't think we'll always need these, but we we Catholics, for sure, just go to the cathedrals of Europe, and the Anglicans are just as bad, you know. We certainly have the Oedipus complex. <laughs> <laughs> And I can understand. That's where the psyche was at that time in history. Build beautiful edifices, and they will come. And they did. But they don't come too much anymore, except uh, as a museum piece. So uh, I think the Spirit is still moving us toward the new temple as the human person. That you are the carrier of the mystery. And to stop thinking if we gather people in pretty spaces, it's going to happen. We tried that. We Catholics did. Didn't work because you fall in love with the pretty spaces, understand, instead of healing pretty people. And look at the ministry of Jesus. All he does is heal people. He is very people-oriented. There's no indication of building buildings and decorating buildings. And I love Christian art. And I love fires and flames right above me. But let's not put too much more history into that. Yeah. But I think that's, again, just such a hope inspiring thought to think that in this day this growth in those who are identifying as spiritual but not religious could it be that we are identifying with the spirit within us at all things and not with the temples and all of the things that come with religion so i think that leads me to this question that i'll throw at you which i'll talk about this because there are two major trends in global spirituality right now and the first is there's a great interest in returning to the perennial traditions, um, the traditions before the traditions. So instead of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, people are going to Celtic spirituality, pagan spirituality, native spirituality, African spirituality. At the same time, there's also this movement towards integrated spirituality through things like yoga, things that incorporate mind, body, and spirit as spiritual practice. So, and these both, in very many ways, stand opposed to the institution of religion. So, continuing down this path, can you talk a little bit about those two trends, holistic spirituality and then this perennial spirituality, and mm -hmm. what that means? Well, you know what will free you most to trust the holistic is to trace the trajectory of the perennial. The book I'm writing right now is on the universal Christ. And I found, again, this is the way we Catholics are trained, you know, that you can't just say, I say. You've got to build on the tradition. Sort of like the Supreme Court. What did the people before me say? How can I build on that? Four fathers of the church, the one you would most be familiar with is Augustine. 
was the only father equally honored by the East and the West. And Augustine said, the Christian religion existed before Christianity. Three other fathers of the church say the same thing. Here's their point. The Christ existed from all eternity. Native religions, in many cases, that saw spirit hidden in matter, hold on to that, spirit revealed through materiality, terrible, secular things like yoga, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this was the oldest spirituality. The older native spiritualities were closer to the true meaning of Christianity than the later ones did. And now, if they got a heretic, I just criticized John Paul too, but when he addressed all the native peoples in Phoenix over 20 years ago, they were all there in this big arena, uh, gathered to meet the Pope, and he said, you already saw the great spirit in all preachers, all preachers. He says, we have to teach Catholics that. So, to, to, to chart the whole tradition, you recognize that native spirituality in particular, Celtic spirituality, did you mention Celtic? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I came to a retreat at Iona about eight years ago on that island on the northern end of the British Isles, uh, sort of evangelized much of the rest of the British Isles. And if you've ever seen some of those standing Celtic crosses, they're still there. They haven't been pushed over, I can't believe. And not one of them has the corpus. There are all these Celtic knots and the curly cues, and of all things, and I'm an animal lover, so I love this, animals, there's animals all over them, you know. This is still a nature-based, primitive, incarnational Christianity, you understand? It hasn't become so heady, so atonement-based, so sacrificial, it's still connected to the natural world. And of course, why did that happen? And you, you who know your history, uh, Scotland and Ireland and Wales were not a part of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Empire were one and the same for centuries. That was, I guess, good for us, but it was terrible for us too. And those who were outside of the control of the Roman system, they maintained that more primitive, nature-based Christianity. And when I say nature-based, I'm not talking about the worshiping of trees. <laughs> I'm talking about the incarnation. And the early fathers of the church said, when the word became flesh, as it's put in John's gospel, they're not just saying the word became Jesus. They're saying the Logos took on materiality, physicality, all of humanity. Everything created was accepted and loved by God. This is what Matthew Fox called already 30 years ago, creation spirituality. You know, where we begin, and this is important, I'll forgive me if you're going so long, but where we begin with Genesis 1. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good. And why? I mean, it's almost damnable, right? Forgive me for using the word. That we, we prefer to begin with Genesis 3. But the problem, you know? And we Catholics started that, but here's again where you Protestants did reform us. <laughs> you were supposed to reform us, but for the most part, you, you did the same thing all over again. Yours was not a creation-based spirituality. You didn't begin with Genesis 1 either. But now the Hubble telescope, the nature of the universe, we can't deny that God has already revealed. In Franciscan spirituality, the first incarnation is creation. Big Bang. In fact, that's the feminine incarnation, the embodiment. And the second incarnation is 2,000 years ago. But all we got interested in was the second incarnation. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You know, and I love Jesus. But you've got to realize Jesus came out of creation, you know? And uh, that connection, if there's another connection after the Trinitarian, is we've got to get back to a original innocence instead of original sin. And when you start with the problem, when you start with original sin, when, you, when any discussion you've ever had in your life, even with your wife or your husband, you start with the problem, you'll never get beyond the problem. You understand? You've got to start with vision. You've got to start with something positive. What did God create all this for? You know? 
And was it just because that damn Adam and Eve ate that apple and God's pissed off and then he demands a blood sacrifice? This whole thing is such a small storyline that it, we frankly have made it too easy to reject. It's so easy to leave Christianity for the millennium, for your generation. It just doesn't cohere. Now, my generation, we had a certain humility or was it ignorance? I don't know. But we, we accept it. We accept it, that even with all of its parts that didn't fit together. That's not going to be true of your generation or the subsequent ones. Because it, they've got a, a universal worldview. They've grown up, to be very honest, seeing pictures of the Hubble telescope. And we have to have a God that is at least as big as the universe, which is still expanding. And we can't have a God whose whole storyline depends upon a sin that was committed between the Tigris and Euphrates River. <laughs> By one man and one woman that just got God all upset. It just doesn't, it's not a believable storyline. But it worked in the mythological ages, you know? But your mind has moved beyond that. I'm not trying to push you there. You're already there. Understand? But it's why there's such a low level of commitment. Now, I'm going to pick on the Catholics again. That's the only group I can really pick on. But I'm lucky enough to be able still to be a good priest and dress all up and celebrate Sunday Mass. <laughs> and they like me. I'm in Holy Family in the South Valley here. We have a good relationship. But to be honest, as I look out at the congregation, where our churches are much bigger than this, of course, but they're filled with bored to death people. <laughs> <laughs> they just look like they can't wait to get out of there. You know? <laughs> and they're nice people. They really are nice. Most of them are Mexican-American, sweet, good Catholics who obey the laws. But you can tell that their actual level of excitement about this message it's very minimal. You understand? It's just a belonging system. And I'm not saying that to put them down. I'm saying that to help you understand that this storyline does not grab the psyche. And if it's good news, as you said, it's got to grab the soul. You understand? This really is good. This makes sense. This works. This is real. And I think that's where we're moving now. Uh, a good news that is actually good news as the birth of narrative it says in Luke's gospel for all the people. This is good. The birth of Jesus was announced as good news for all the people, not for a little selection. What's always stunning to me is that this message, everything you're saying is 30 times more biblical than the message that's claimed as the biblical message. Forgive me for being so arrogant, but I, I obviously think that too. <laughs> <laughs> They love the Bible so much they don't even know what it seems like. Except a few choice verses that they pulled out of context and made the whole into a lot. Sure. Right. Yeah, um, I think I'm going to give you a question else. Yeah, I'll try to stick to it. That sums up your entire <laughs> philosophy and work right now. Um, and it's really important, I think. There are major movements in our world right now for intersectional justice across the nation and around the world. And yet religious communities tend to fall either on the completely spiritual religious side of things or on the completely activist yeah, let's do social good. justice side of very things. Very good, no depth to it. Yeah. yeah, and even last week, I mean, uh, the Washington Post reported that a majority of churches um, and evangelicals are opposing so many movements for justice right now. Yeah. Healthcare. Yeah. Was, the okay. whole world agrees with it. Absolutely. Except one party in this country. Right. And, and so the question then becomes, okay, so you've got this one group here that's rejecting all of this justice because of their theology and dogma. You've got these groups over here that have barely any theology, any grounding, and yet they're doing all this justice. How do you bring the two together, and is that even possible? Yeah. Well, of course, some of it is temperament. By nature, some of us are more cautious. By nature, others of you are risky. By nature, some of you are more introverted, maybe coming on the contemplative side, prayer side, study side. Some of you, by nature, are more doers, what we call activists. If it isn't happening, it doesn't excite you. So let's honor that to begin with, which God clearly does, that we all have our temperamental preferences. 
But uh, the reason we named our center here, we're 30 years old. I came to Albuquerque 31 years ago. Uh, and I named the center, the Center for Action and Contemplation. I deliberately put the word action first, because I believe until you've acted, you don't have anything to contemplate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I really say the most important word in the title is am, action and contemplation. And for me, that's still the supreme Christian art form, and I do mean art form to know how to be very engaged, but from a grounded, peaceful, loving place. And how when you go to prayer, to be holding Syria and South Sudan consciously in your heart, you know what I mean? That takes your whole life, to know how to hold those two together. But that's gotta be where we're, we're, we're inviting people. And of course, just psychologically speaking, that creates much healthier people. And not just head trip people, and not just empty activism that is frenetic and, and sort of nonsensical. It's just, and and if, you, if we'd had longer to, to be together, you would see I criticize the liberal left just as much as the conservative right. Because the liberal left can be empty headed in where their devotion comes from, where the commitment comes from. And that's why I love so many people like Brandon. I know there's a number of you in this room who began Baptist or Evangelical or even Fundamentalist. They're often the ones who hold in the longest because you have that solid Jesus foundation, inner experience, baptism in the spirit if you were a Pentecostal. Um, those things hold people for the long term. Whereas the heady, intellectual Christianity that often Catholicism became guilty of, Presbyterianism did too, um, it doesn't hold you together in a real hard time to struggle because the heart is not engaged with the head. So I guess that's another general pattern we're going to see. That we've got to put head and heart together and we've got to put inner and outer action and contemplation. So it's still the work of the integration, always the work. You know, it's no accident that our English word holy comes from whole. It's the same word. Uh, and kata holon was Catholic, according to the whole. The whole, the more you can put together, the more you can hold, the more you can forgive, the more you can include, the more you're like God. <coughs> God is the great includer. What else could God be? I just ask you. What else could God be? The ultimate includer. And that we ended up being known by much of the world as an exclusionary religion. What do you hate? <laughs> Who are you against? You know? And of course, because I was so well trained in Catholic history, you look at every century, we chose a different group to hate. You know? <laughs> it was heretics, it was women, it was sinners. It was Jews, it was black people who could be enslaved. Only recently did we start hating gays this much because we just <laughs> kept them hidden in most of history. But that's the reason. There, there's always got to be some place where we project our shadow. Whereas Jesus holds it, just holds it, forgives humanity, forgives everything. So uh, the world has come to see that we're not very much like Jesus. And I love. The Center for Action and Contemplation, because I think that is, I mean, and this is another thing the Catholic tradition gives to us, is that this Eucharist every single week is this image of breaking open and pouring out, breaking open our bodies and pouring out our lives. It's taking in from God, receiving from God, with the call to go out as the example for our lives, and that's what I see, that rhythm. Both have part of the truth, but because both are true. It's in the human, but not just in the human. As I said, I'm an animal lover, and I just lost my dog a few months ago, so you know what that feels like. Once you know the mystery is universal, it's everywhere, that the entire material universe is a manifestation of spirit. And that we've got to move beyond this anthropocentric, that all the creation is just a backdrop for us human beings. That, that 13.6 billion years, all these dinosaurs and 
mastodons were just, just a game. I was just playing, waiting for the Roman Catholic Church to appear. <laughs> I don't think so. The whole thing, as the Psalms say, part of the glory of God. The river